was devoted Like a ring of solid gold Like a vow that is tested Like a covenant of old Your love is enduring Through entering And beyond the horizon With mercy for today Faithful you have been And faithful you will be You pledge yourself to me And that's why I see your praise Will ever be on my lips Ever be on my lips Your praise will ever be on my lips Ever be on my lips Your praise will ever be on my lips Ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. strength becomes our own you're making me like you you're clothing me in white bringing beauty from ashes for you will have your bride free from all her guilt and rid of all her shame and known by her true name and that's why Ever be on my lips, ever be on 
that you guys have joined us both in person and online this morning. Um, we're going to continue just to sing, and I just want to pray um, that the the words that we're singing, that the, um, the attitudes of our hearts are just honoring to the Lord this morning. Uh, Father God, we're so grateful to be here, to be able to gather together, to, um, man, to just bless your name, um, and to do that alongside of our brothers and sisters is just an honor, God. Um, I pray as we continue just to sing this morning, um, and I, I just pray that we are, um, our, our attitudes, God, our hearts are um, just before you, God, that we lay everything on the line before you as we sing these words. I pray that they're not just words on the screen or um, on the computer, God, but that they're the actual um, words pouring out of our hearts to you, God, in adoration for who you are and thankfulness for everything that you've done for us. God, we love you. We thank you so much for how much you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. Before I spoke a word 
you're singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I found leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it. Will you give yourself away? Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so
ashamed of what I've done, what I've become. These hands are dirty. I dare not lift them up to the Holy One. You plead my cause. You so much for for your love God for loving us so much that you sent your son to, to die for us God to give us an example of how to live and to give us an example of how to love the way that you've designed God but this morning as we talk about relationships um, I, I pray that you would 
remind us of our most important relationship with you, God. And I pray that our relationship with you is, is constantly being um, changed, being strengthened, God. That we're, we're moving closer to you, we're drawing closer to you every single day. God, we thank you for, and for, for being faithful. God, we thank you for never giving up on us. And we, we thank you above all for, for sending Jesus. God, we love you so much, and we just pray that you are honored this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So, do me a favor. I need you to remember the lines from the song that we did a minute ago. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. That's going to come in handy towards the end of the message, so keep that locked in your brain. Get ready for this. So, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I am Pastor Jared. I'm the student ministries pastor here. Absolutely love getting the opportunity to come and talk to the big kids in the room. Uh, it's, it's exceptional. Um, I, I think... I think what we have going on here at North Hills where we get to split preaching duties is so unique and so cool. Um, and so thank you, Pastor Zach, again for giving me the opportunity to be up here. We're going to be continuing our marriage series this week. Uh, this will be our third week of the marriage mystery. Um, before we dive completely into that, though, I have a story I want to tell you, okay? So when I was in college... Uh, one of the things that I absolutely loved to do with my free time was to go paintballing. Uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, it's a specialized air gun that shoots out round little balls full of paint, right? Uh, yeah, it hurts. Uh, <laughs> it really does, especially when you start playing with people who spend way too much time, energy, and money on the sport, like I did. Uh, and, and you don't just get hit once, you get hit about 15, 20 times before you're fully out. So, one particular time though, a buddy of mine said, hey, can I go with you? And I said, sure, let's go to the paintball field on Saturday, let's go have some fun. Uh, this was a buddy of mine that we'd become really close uh, through college. Um, started out that the only reason we got to know each other was because he happened to be in the room, and I walked in and I said, oh, Fresh meat. I don't know him. I'll pick on him. So I used every ounce of sarcasm in my body for about two years to try and pick on him every single time that I saw him. And the next thing you know, he's dropping words like best friend and mentor. And I'm going, oh, <laughs> so sarcasm is how we get through to people. Got it. So me and this buddy of mine, we go up to the paintball field, right? And we're playing. And, and to give you a lay of the land, imagine a decent sized forest. And in the center of the forest, is a castle built out of plywood, right? It's two stories. You can go in, and, and, and it's got open windows and doors, and then you can stand on the second floor and shoot down at people. And our job was to go to this castle, capture the flag, and then get out. So me and my buddy immediately, right off the bat, we start running. I used to be able to run a lot better than I can now. We ran straight to the castle, got there pretty quickly, got up inside, uh, the flag was hidden on the second floor somewhere, so we start wandering around through. We find it, right, stuff it in the pocket, and as we're coming back out, we start hearing voices shouting, I think I saw him go that way, or look over there. And we realized the other team had gotten there pretty quickly. And now here we are on the second floor of this building, essentially trapped, the two of us, the rest of our team, apparently had just decided to go home. Uh, and so we're stuck on the second floor of this building all alone as there's about 15 to 20 enemy players up there. Eventually, you know, because we're in our late teens, early 20s, we do incredibly smart things. We popped our heads out windows, uh, which allowed them to see exactly where we are and begin firing massive amounts of very fast moving balls of plastic full of paint at our heads. We duck back inside just in time to hear ta -ta 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 up against the sides of the walls and the windows all around us. I look at him, and with all ounce of seriousness, I said, take the flag and go. I'm going to give you a diversion. 
My intention was I had a really nice gun, and I was going to stand up, and I was going to begin to fire at all the enemy as fast as I could, and he was going to break out the back door and run and go win the game. And he looks back at me, and again, with all brave heart level seriousness, goes, I'm not leaving you. And I said, then we do it together. We went down to the bottom floor, and we kicked open doors, and we start, ah! To which we both got hit like 15 or 20 times. And we're out. Very painful experience. Uh, we did not win the game. They won the game because, like I said, the rest of our team went home early, apparently. And that was it. The reason I tell that story, though, is, is I learned something in that moment about relationships. I learned something about love, right? Now, we throw the word love around like it's candy, right? I mean, I love my wife. That's a great use of the word love. I love Taco Bell. Not as great of a use of the word, but doesn't mean I don't use it. We throw the word love around like it's absolutely nothing. And yet, in that moment, knowing the amount of pain and bruises and welts that we were going to experience by both of us staying and fighting to the bitter end, rather than just one of us and the other one escaping with their life or body not in pain, he said no. He said, I'm not leaving. You know, we laughed about it the whole car ride home, like, what were we doing? Dude, you should have gone. I know I should have gone. But he told me, he goes, I, I just, I couldn't. If you were going down, I was going down with you. Right? To this day, me and that friend still talk. And, and even though we live literally on opposite ends of the country, when we talk, when we have conversations, they can go a couple of months without talking, but the conversations aren't, so how's the weather where you are? Like, we have deep conversations, like, <laughs> I remember the last time we called, he picked up the phone, and uh, I said, hey man, how's it going? He goes, good, so tell me what's gone wrong in your marriage lately. That was how he opened the conversation, because let's be honest, anybody who's ever been married knows that there are fights, there are arguments, there are things. No one's ever perfect in marriage. And so even if it's something like, she rolled up in the covers again last night and I didn't sleep. Whatever the issue is, there's something. And he knew we needed to get straight to the serious stuff. We had built a bond through years of shared experiences that led us to a place where, man, I, he wasn't going to leave me. Even though it meant a lot of pain, he wasn't going to go anywhere. And that's love. That is a deep kind of a love that says, I'm willing to sacrifice and put you above me. Love is the most powerful force that exists in our universe. Our God is love. And when he created the universe, the universe echoes his love. From the moment we are born, we scream until someone picks us up and holds us and comforts us. When we're children, we reach for someone to give us affection. My son, Reagan, uh, he's a pistol. He really is. Uh, he enjoys pushing every button I have and invents new buttons to push every couple of weeks. And when I start coming down on him and saying, you know, and, and we're getting to that point where punishment is coming, his automatic mechanism is, okay, but can I have a hug? Because he's okay with the punishment as long as he knows that, that he's loved. Love is the basis for everything that we do, but I th think we misinterpret love sometimes. I think we don't give it enough oomph in our lives. Again, I love my wife, I love my son, I love. Taco Bell. This morning, we are going to dive into the depths of what love should mean, specifically inside of marriage, but also generally beyond that. Pray with me real quick this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much that we get to be here, that we get to be a community next to each other, supporting one another in your presence, where we can learn about you, engage with you. You have plans, you have ways and pathways for us to live that would make things better for us. Lord, I pray that this morning you open our eyes, you open our ears and our hearts to hear what you would have to say to us. Allow us to 
dive wholeheartedly into your way of doing things. Make it clear to us where we're lacking. Allow us to relish in the areas that you've already built us up and allow us to draw closer to one another during the process. In your amazing, awesome, and wonderful name we pray. Amen. So, I want to give you one more image real quick before we dive into any scripture this morning. Uh, The author, C.S. Lewis, once wrote a book called The Great Divorce. And in The Great Divorce, he is exploring an artistic recreation of heaven and hell through a fictional story. Okay? And the way it begins is with a man who is at a bus stop in hell, getting ready to get onto a bus to go experience heaven. Okay? Now, I don't want to break down the whole story because that doesn't actually get us where we're going this morning. But I want to, for half a second, give you the image of hell. His image of hell is a massive, dark city. A city that is literally never-ending in every direction. Okay? It says you could literally walk your entire existence and never find another person. It's that big. It's that spread out. The windows are all closed and boarded up. Businesses are not running. And even if they were, the things they're selling are nothing you would ever want or need. As you get further and further out, you begin to see massive mansions that nobody lives in, that have been long abandoned. There's dust, there's dirt, and there's an eerie silence. I think C.S. Lewis uses this imagery because that is literally our worst nightmares. Being completely and utterly alone in an atmosphere that was never designed to be completely empty and alone. If you've got your Bibles real quick, turn with me. We are going to start in the most perfect place to discuss marriage, the book of Revelation. Chapter 21, verse 2. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride on her wedding day, adorned for her husband and his eyes only. Now, what we've got here, for those of you who are unaware of the Revelation timeline, at this point, when this event is happening, all enemy of God has been vanquished. There is nothing left opposing God. The only thing left in existence is God and those who are with God. That's it. Armageddon has been done. The final battles have been done. The enemy of God has been vanquished and thrown away. And God is about to reward everybody. He's making them a promise. He's saying, for everything that you have done, for the choices that you have made to stick by my side at all times, I am rewarding you with a city. A massive, glowing city city. Now, we need a little bit of whole historical context here, because if any of you are anything like me, cities are the last thing I want, right? I, I escape as often as possible to the solitude, to the woods, to the mountains, to the beach, anything I can do to get out of a city, right? I mean, C.S. Lewis just t- described hell with a city. So why is God using a city as the ultimate reward? Because it means something different to them than it does to us. Put yourself in the mindset of somebody who's living 2,000 plus years ago. Get your mind there, right? In a place where there's no cars, there's no cell phones, there's no computers, there's no anything. The majority of the world lived in rural farms and communities all by themselves. They were isolated. It was a family in the middle of nowhere, 50 miles from anything. And they were their world. Meaning, if your crops didn't succeed, you died. If the well that you dug three generations ago finally went dry, you died. If your horse, that you, the one mode of transportation that you had to get away, broke its leg died. If bandits decided they wanted what you had, you were a 
alone, no backup, and you die. Cities were the prize of the ancient world. They had walls. They had armies and guards. They had food stalls on the corners, multiple wells. They had religious establishments. They had government leaders. Right? This was everything people wanted and needed in life. No longer were they going through anything alone. They had community. Right? If my stuff failed, maybe Jim Bob down the street's got what I need. It wasn't an easy existence back then. Life was terrifying. Better yet, you were responsible for everything in your life. But when you moved into a city, there were establishment rules. There were things you couldn't do. There were laws that held people in check, that kept communities together and growing. And so when God offers them a perfect city coming out of heaven, his city, he's making them a promise. He's saying, your reward for loving me the way that I loved you is that you are not alone. Your existence is no longer stuck. You don't have to live in fear of what's out of your control. I've got you. We have got you. This is an important thing to grasp in relationships because God in Revelation is setting the scene for all of our relationships. He is telling us you are not to be alone. Right? It ties back to Genesis and the creation story. Man shouldn't be alone. We weren't meant to be on our own. Love is useless when there's no one to give it to or receive it from. The core attribute of our universe becomes useless when you're on your own. So we get a city on a hill. But then God begins to up the ante, right, in Scripture. And he says, this is going to go more. We are going to dive deeper into what those non-alone relationships look like. Where's the boundaries? Where does this stop and start? Right? At what point do you give up? At what point do you let go? At what point do you say enough is enough? I'm not talking to this person again. Well, introduce Hosea, a small prophet in the Old Testament, who God said, hey buddy, you are a You're going to work for me. You're going to spread my word around Jerusalem. By the way, I need you to get married. And I need you to know right off the bat, she is not going to be faithful. Your marriage is going to be a sham. Everybody's going to know it. And everybody's going to talk about it. Enjoy that. God is asking something that today, in this day and age, would have meant an annulment three days into the marriage. Right? And he's saying... I need you to know up front this is going to happen, and I need you to be okay with it. Already we are talking about a level of relationship tension that is well beyond what we expect. And yet, at the beginning of Hosea, we get this. I'm going to marry you. And this time, it'll be forever in righteousness and justice. Our covenant will reflect a loyal love and great mercy. Our marriage will be honest and truthful, and you'll understand who I really am, the eternal one. Notice the way this is worded. At no point is there a question. Man, I really hope our marriage is. Man, I really hope our relationship becomes. These are the goals I have. No. In spite of everything that is happening in this marriage and in these relationships between God and Hosea and Hosea and his wife and all of this, we get it will be forever righteousness, justice. And then they throw that big word down, covenant. Covenant is a term that God uses throughout the Old Testament multiple times and in the New Testament as well. It is an unbreakable bond. God uses this word when he's talking to us, when he says things like, here's a rainbow, my covenant that I will never flood the earth again. Right? When he talks about being with us, right? They refer to Jesus in Isaiah at times as a covenant because it's God saying, 
you're not alone, and no matter what you do, I'm there. Remember those lyrics I was talking about a little early on? Reckless love of God. I remember when that song came out, there were an awful lot of people who hated the idea of God being reckless. Well, no. Reckless to me is loving somebody so much that no matter what they do to you, no matter how badly they hurt you, you never give up. That's exactly what Hosea is talking about. That's exactly what God is talking about. Reckless love. Covenant love. This is not easy, by the way. This is not something that I stand up here and say, it's easy to master. Everybody go home and do this, right? Now, I will say this. This is the kind of relationship that Chelsea and I have, my wife. And I say this because my wife has seen the absolute worst of me. Now, granted, I'm almost perfect, so it's not that bad. But no, she has seen me so low that I'm ashamed to tell stories about those times in my lives to people. She's seen me do and say things that every single one of us would want to hide and strike from our records. She has seen all of it. To use the vows that we say at our weddings all the time, she's seen me at the poorer. She's seen me in sickness. She's seen me all of the worst sides of those vows. My wife has seen me. And every single time, rather than walk away, rather than yell and scream at me, rather than get mad at me and tell me, fix it or I'm done, every single time my wife looks at me and says, I love you, how can I make you better? Which is baffling to me sometimes. Because I'll be honest, if I had done to me some of the things that have happened in my life, I would say, I'm done with you. Go away. But that's not the kind of relationship God asks us for. That's trivial. We've all had friends that were friends and great friends at a time, and we haven't talked to them in years. Those were throwaway relationships. Those were timed relationships for a certain moment. We all also have those relationships, friends, family members, that no matter what they do, you're never going to give up on them. My children are this way with me. I have a covenant relationship with my children. No matter what Reagan and Colt ever do, they could break every law known to man ten times over, and it will never change the way that I see my children. They will forever be my loves. Now, I'm not saying they're not going to hurt me, because they will. I'm not saying that they're not going to make poor choices, because they will. They're my kids. I'm not saying that the relationship won't be tested, that trust won't be broken, because it will. Right? Trust is the most important thing to building a covenant relationship, and by the way, it's usually the first thing thrown out of a covenant relationship. The minute we say, I do, whether it's to a marriage or whether it's with a friend, or whatever your I do moment is, that's the first moment the enemy says, cool, let me see how I can mess this up for them. Trust is the most important thing to building the relationship, and it's the first thing that disappears out of the relationship. The question for us becomes, are we willing to step back into it? Are we willing to fight through and say, I don't trust you, but that doesn't matter, I love you. You hurt me, but that doesn't matter, I love you. By the way, if you're saying no, then you've got an issue because that's how God treats you. Every single day, you do something to break God's heart. Every single day, millions of people sin. We make mistakes. We are human. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No matter what we do, though, God says, I love you. And I'm still waiting to give you that city all the strength and security and, and profitability and love and connection and relationship that you need. So how do we get there? 
how do we move from a normal relationship of you're my friend, right? My wife and I were friends before we ever dated, right? We would talk on the phone, uh, we would hang out, we worked together for a while. We were friends. But that's a long way from I will put you in front of me at all times. So how do you get there? Well, enter Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verses 6 through 7. And it says this. Set me as a seal over your heart. Wear me as an emblem on your arm, for love is as strong as death, and jealousy as relentless as the grave. Love flares up like a blazing fire, a very ardent flame. No amount of water can quench love. A raging flood cannot drown it out. If a person tried to exchange all of his wealth for love, then he would still surely be rejected. Okay, I want to draw you to the first and the last little bits of that. First, set me as a seal over your heart. Covenant relationship, those kinds of relationships that never give up, never give in, the kind of relationship that God wants with us and that he offers to us every single day is a choice. Our choice. This is why we say vows at weddings. This is why we have witnesses at weddings. This is why we throw celebrations. This is why we sign paperwork and give it to the government because it is us saying once and for all, I choose forever, for always, no matter what. That is what that statement is meant to be. Now I realize circumstances and life and things happen but when you make the statement, I do, that's what you are doing. You are walking in with that in your heart. And the minute that trust flies out the window, the minute something goes wrong, you need to remember that. You need to hold on to the beauty of a city that God is offering full of relationship and life and joy and happiness you need to remember all of those moments because we are going to see each other at our worst. We are going to see each other when we are our lowest. There are going to be moments, long moments, where you get absolutely nothing out of a relationship. You're only giving. And it might seem like that is forever. But it doesn't matter. Once we say, I choose it, that's what we're calling ourselves to. And I truly believe that in most circumstances, if we fight through, we find a way to heal. We find a way to get back to beauty and joy and happiness again. If we put our hearts in God's hands this way, if we stoke that love fire continuously, our relationships build to a point where we say, no matter the paintballs, I'm with you. Relationships are not throwaway things. We are making covenants. Right? And I think this is actually something that most of us understand quite deeply. It really is. It's why movie franchises like Fast and Furious get nine sequels. Right? Because they have chosen to build something special. Right? They have made covenant relationships the characters have. It's the kinds of things that bring them back time and time again to blow up a new bank or fly a plane off of a cliff or jump out of a, you know, moving cars, do dangerous, horrible things to protect one another. Right? Because in our cores, we want this. We want people to be willing to sacrifice everything for us, and we want somebody to be willing to sacrifice everything for. We want that kind of love in our lives. That's why marriage is important, because they're supposed to be the first person that we are willing to give everything to. I told my wife, standing at the altar, when I say I do, it means you before me forever. Not that that's always easy and not that I always succeed. Close, but not always. 
I love that. But that's my goal. That's what I strive for. I wake up every single day, and I don't say, I wonder what I'm going to get from my marriage today. I wonder what my kids are going to bless me with today. I wonder what those friends that I've chosen to make family are going to do for me today. I wonder if my parents and my grandparents and my siblings, I wonder if they're going to love me the way I need to be loved today. I don't wake up like that. That's not what covenant relationship is. Right? That's like marrying somebody who has all these faults and you see them and you go, yeah, but they're hot. When we are building covenant relationships, we're waking up in the morning going, I wonder how I can make them better. I wonder how me being in their lives will lift them up a little bit further today. If you're not doing that, then you're not in a covenant relationship. Covenant relationship was defined by God in the beginning. Because that's what he does for us. He literally left heaven to come to earth to allow us to torture him to save ourselves. Jesus died at our hands for us. Talk about waking up in the morning and say, I'm going to lift them up. And I'm not asking any of you to go sit on a cross. God isn't asking any of you to sit on a cross, but he is asking you to bear the needs of those that you are in relationship with. Whether it's friends, whether it's family, whether it's a spouse, whether it's children, it doesn't matter. Your covenant relationship, the relationship that you have chose to set as a seal on your heart, it's deeper. It's more. I love it this way. A quote from Italan Egging, the book of maximum, Maxim's poems and anecdotes writes this, bond is stronger than blood. The family grows stronger by bond. I love this because what they're saying is blood is situational. You didn't choose your parents. You didn't choose your kids. You cannot control who they are. You cannot control what they do all the time, even though we as parents would love to be able to do that. Right? I would love Reagan to always eat his food when I tell him to and not throw it at his little brother. Doesn't mean I can't. I can react once he's done it, but that's not me stopping him from doing it in the first place. Blood is situational. Bond is choice. When you bond yourself to somebody, it's deeper. It's more. And when bond takes place inside of family, inside of blood, it's even better. Right? There's that marriage end all be all. Marriage is so important because it's saying, not only am I choosing relationship with that person, I'm making them family. I'm making them blood. My love is now everlasting and expanding further. Not that it'll be easy, because let's be honest, it's probably harder. The ones we love the most hurt us the most. The ones we love the most, we hurt the most. None of us are innocent. None of us ever are perfect. But we bank on the love. There are seasons when things are going to be horrible. There are seasons when things are just going to be wrong. There are going to be seasons when you have to take the paintballs with them. And there are going to be seasons when it's nothing but victory. There are going to be seasons when it's nothing but joy and winning. I told you earlier, Chelsea's seen me at my lows. You know what she's also seen? My highs. She's also seen the best parts of me. The moments when I am at my best, most connected to God, most connected to her. She's seen the love flow out of me towards people, her, my children, you. So it's not all bad. Toughness is a part of it. But man, God puts us in these situations because it's good for us. After all, it's the final reward when all things go away. When all enemy is vanquished, God says, I offer you relationship. Perfect covenant relationship. Welcome to my city. So church, as you leave this morning from wherever you are, as you step out of this building, as you go to 
work, as you go across the hall to the next room, as you talk to people, as you interact, as you build covenant relationships in your marriages, in your family, with your friends, as you say, I bond you, I put my seal with you, I set a covenant the way God did with me, with you, I pray your hearts are open. I pray you take the weight of that choice in hand. I pray that you prepare yourself for all of the lows of that person, and I pray you celebrate every moment of high to a whole new level. I pray you get these experiences. I pray you never find yourself alone. I pray you constantly turn to the one who first offered you covenant relationship, God himself. And I pray that every single one of you have an amazing, awesome week. In his wonderful, glorious, amazing, awesome name we pray. Amen. Thank you all so much for being here this morning. It was a pleasure seeing you. I am glad I got to interact. Have an amazing week. You're dismissed.